Murtaza Hussein. He's a writer, columnist, journalist for The Intercept. And uh, he has a new piece, uh, Trump. Uh, two Brooklyn lawyers accused of throwing a Molotov cocktail are the public face of Trump's crackdown on dissent, uh, which you can read in The Intercept. Uh, Murtaza, are you there? I'm here. You see me? Yes, I see you. Thanks so much. Thanks for doing this. How are you? My pleasure. Good. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Another, we, another, another, uh, uh, a brother in co- in uh, in in uh, quarantine beard here. Yeah, we're going full quarantine beard until normality returns. <laughs> yes, sir. Exactly. Um, so, can you remind us? I mean, this this story uh, it 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 already feels like ages ago, but it happens in the beginning of the uprisings, in the beginning of the protests against uh, police uh, racism and violence that were taking place across the country. And um, the first couple of nights in New York, it, and it's very important, and you point this out a lot in your article, the overwhelming reality was of a, you know, just as there was nationwide, this hugely vicious and violent response by the NYPD, um, including driving a car into protesters, throwing a really, you know, a very petite woman into the ground, giving her a concussion. I mean, these were of many, 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 many examples. Um, and then there was some, uh, you know, in the main, there's there's one story about but one protester actually accused of literally trying to throw a Molotov cocktail at cops. I don't know anything about like that. That That's one I don't know about. Um, as much I'll look into. I actually learned about it from reading your article, but everything else was a question of, of uh, property damage. And if we take immediately out of the gate, the property damage is regardless of what you think of it is not, is in no way analogous in any way, shape or form to actually harming people. Um, the, you know, these stories of, of vandalism or whatever else were, were kind of greatly exaggerated. So, this was an irresistible story to the press because it was two, you know, like successful young attorneys. And maybe you could just take us from there, explain who these people are, what they're accused of doing and how it, and how they've, you know, I mean, basically been, are in the process of being railroaded by the press and the judiciary. Totally. So, you know, during those nights of unrest, as you mentioned, New York, there was all types of things going on, violence, from the police, uh, there was property damage. There were, it was an unprecedented many years sort of circumstance. And so these two individuals, Aruj Rahman and Colin Ford Mattis, they're two lawyers in New York in their early 30s. And Colin Ford is, was a corporate lawyer in Manhattan, but he grew up in East New York. And Aruj Rahman was a, uh, or is a uh, public interest lawyer in the Bronx doing housing rights in the Bronx. So, on that night, allegedly, according to the government uh, allegations, and their lawyers seem to have conceded this version of events, the two of them made a small incendiary, basically, out of a beer bottle uh, with some fuel in it, uh, otherwise known as a Molotov cocktail. And in the Fort Greene section of Brooklyn, there were several police vehicles and other vehicles which were damaged that night. And one of these vehicles, which is already smashed, already abandoned during previous hours of unrest that night, the two of them, and this is said to be caught on camera, they went and they smashed the incendiary on the inside of the car, on the dashboard. And it sort of went off a little bit. It burned the dashboard, but the car did not ignite. And this is it. This is what they're accused of doing as per the criminal complaint. There was a vandalized, damaged car, which they did a little more vandalism against. And after being detained, very shortly after, because the NYPD observed this uh, take place, they're now facing, and this is a very shocking part of this case, a minimum of 45 years in prison if convicted on the charges and potentially life in prison. Now, as you mentioned, you know, there has been, a, from the moment these arrests happened, there were a very steady stream of leaks to the New York tabloids about the two of them. And the NYPD or the prosecutor's office or somebody was clearly coordinating this because the framing of the story, it completely, it's a very effective and very uh, interesting case study. They completely reframed what happened in the story. Like in one hand, it's a case of property damage. 
but it's being described almost as, you know, first of all, these two privileged lawyers, like how could these lawyers do this thing? Like who are these goofballs? They did this and that. There was a video of one of them speaking to a local uh, independent news guy on the street before talking about, you know, unread police killings and uh, reprisals against NYPD. And, you know, I, I've noticed this effectively in people I know, like they did a very successful hit job on them. People were completely against them. Although we objectively look at it, they're accused of a property crime. And the only real story here, in my opinion, is the insanely authoritarian government response to try to make an example out of people and send a message that no matter who you are, you can face the most vicious uh, consequences of the justice system in the United States for the most minor inconsequential act. And so, and you also pointed out that again, even her words, that Newsday presented these words as if she was, you know, and again, it just makes no sense. Like, if this was actually her belief, I really doubt she would be foolish enough to say it to a, you know, on online and to a reporter, but they edited this video as if to say she was talking about actual violence against members of the NYPD. When the full video was released unedited, she's clearly talking and I think alluding to, I mean, look, people burned down uh, what is it, the 53rd, I, I don't remember the name of the precinct in Minneapolis. They burned down the precinct where the murderers of George Floyd came from. That's what she was alluding to. She was not talking about hurting individuals, but it was it was framed by, in the press as her talking about, you know, going out and, and specifically trying to harm people. It was crazy because I saw that there was basically a four minute interview she did with someone on the street. Uh, an independent news outlet and the New York daily news clipped about a minute and 30 seconds of that and cut it together. And it makes it seem like she's talking about killing NYPD officers that night, the most provocative sort of uh, framing of what she said. In reality, the full clip is saying something very different. And she's actually making a good point, which is that the police accused of killings, they get bail. For instance, they are eligible for bail why no property is worth more than a human life, which everyone should be able to agree with. And, you know, a dashboard is not worth more than a human life. But Derek Chauvin is eligible for bail. The people who killed Breonna Taylor are eligible for bail. But Colin Ford Mattis and Uj Rahman... They get charged. Sorry. They get charged, right. Uh, Colin Ford Mattis and Uj Rahman, the government is fighting tooth and nail to deny them bail, which is unheard of, almost unheard of, except in cases of terrorism or... Uh, violent organized crime. It's very, very rare that the government will go to such extreme lengths. And the message they're implicitly sending is that the kill, the destruction of this, the damage of this already damaged car is a more serious offense than killing an unarmed person, uh, depending on the context. It's a very disturbing, disturbing framing. And it, this whole episode has reminded me of that Malcolm X quote. It's almost a cliche, but it's absolutely true. That, you know, the news can really have you hating the wrong person in a certain circumstance because the hit job has been so effective that you know, a lot of people just assume this framing because it's just it was very uh, provocative and very sensational. The actual facts of the case are one of extreme government overreach and authoritarianism. Remind, well, I think that, and let's talk a little bit about why it was so I mean, in general, with the speed of media propaganda amplified by social media in general people should just pause here you know especially with something like this um because these not these narratives are going to be very consciously cultivated by prosecutors by the justice department and the press but there's also this this like lineage of uh radical chic that old tom wolf article about you know like the new york intelligentsia um you know, supporting the Black Panthers. And of course, like, look, there is, you know, there, there, there is like a a critique of a certain type of like very bougie privileged person that is very drawn to like the aesthetics of radicalism. Like no one's going to pretend that that's definitely real. And that's definitely very easy to critique and make fun of. But at the same time, um, you know, there was a response to Wolf's piece written a couple years ago in the Huffington Post. that was basically just like, 
you know, this guy wasn't even supposed to be there. This was a private meeting and it was really about getting, again, like political activists, in this case, the Black Panthers, who are also being railroaded by the federal government for their activism on similar issues, in fact, to get them actual material resources. And then, you know, the hit jobs that came out in the press were to just sort of like make a mockery of the whole thing, including like the core actual issues that are at stake. And I think that the fact that they could just zero in on, look at the, their attorneys, their attorney, like they're successful, like that's it. What more do you need to know? Um, was was very easy, you know, that, to kind of like Tucker Carlson resentment politics almost. I'm so glad you brought up that Tom Wolf article because it's exactly, they're clearly trying to press that button in people's memory. Like, look at these privileged jerks. You know, they had everything and they turned, you know, threw it all away for this aesthetics of this moment uh, and so forth. And I mean, you know, you could say that maybe there's a bit of truth to that in the sense that, you know, in the video of uh, Miss Rahman, she was wearing, she was very dressed for the occasion. Right, so right, right. Well, maybe not what you'd wear if you really were doing this. And maybe there's a critique of that. But, you know, that issue is so minuscule compared to the broader issue now, which is the, you know, a potential lifetime in prison for a very objectively small act or a minimum of 45 years in prison and the <sighs> chilling threat that sends to anyone. A lot of cars were damaged that night in New York. Uh, you know, a lot worse things happened that night on all sides uh, than that. But the government has chosen to elevate this particular incident to the federal level. Politicians have been talking about it. Trump, Trump's son, uh, Marco Rubio. They chose to elevate this in a very specific way. I think, number one, because they would like to uh, revive that sort of thread that Tom Wolf, that Tom Wolf identified of radical chic, of which to people of which towards there's a lot of rightly or wrongly uh, class resentment or other resentment. And they're trying to, I think also there's a kind of a racial angle to it too, because these two, it's kind of like the framing, even the, some of the more nuanced stories in CNN and New York times, they're like, you know, these people, they were success stories. They had everything to come from the Jamaican or Pakistani backgrounds. And then they threw it all the way, turned against everything, you right. know, turned against society. But if you actually look at what happened, they didn't, this is not like, they didn't do the Boston Marathon bombing. They didn't go and fight for a foreign terrorist group or something. They were doing something on behalf of other Americans as they saw it. Americans were suffering from the violence of the judicial system, the police system, and they did a symbolic act of property damage. That's not radicalization. And that's not, you know, what people are trying to imply. There's a very sort of ugly subtext to this. And you know, when you see a particular case of the thousands of people being arrested, the one being heavily promoted by the government in press releases, there's always a political reason for it. Yeah, so talk more about that political reason. And you connect it with, uh, with Bill Barr, you know, as an example. I mean, you, you know, they've, they've had to acknowledge, even though they still soft pedal it, that like the murder of, you know, George Floyd was unjust or something. You know, they use these sort of, softer words around you know a, a public murder captured on a cell phone but um they 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 sort of get that up up front and then they feed this into this whole conspiracy matrix about antifa or whatever that they're using uh to really wage a systemic assault on people's basic capacity to protest in any way they clearly you know in bar statement about the the recent unrest at that time, I think this was early, early, early this month, he issued it. Basically, he is laying down a marker that, you know, we're not saying that this killing was good, we're going to look into it, but we're going to come down extremely harshly on any serious expression of public dissent. And this case, which the press release was issued in connection to, is not necessarily the most seriously violent thing that happened at all during the protest. There were a lot of people shot by the police who lost eyes. There were tear gassings, beatings. A few people died. There were some police officers who were shot. They were, were run over by cars. This was a very strange thing to choose as your example of, you know, the red line. And it's all to create a perception in people's minds of fear that, you know, the line is all the way over here. Don't even think of coming close to it because you could face something that you can never imagine. 45 years and jail a lifetime in jail 
you should not even know where the line is because on a night like that in New York, when all types of things were happening, who would have thought that this is a thing that would be considered the most egregious that would lead to consequences, which are not seen for murders or other heinous crimes. Uh, It's specifically calculated to send a message of uncertainty and fear towards those who would go out and protest or engage in any sort of uncontrollable action from the viewpoint of the government. What are the legal responses so far um, in terms of like, what is the legal team saying um, and, and uh, their legal team and, and others about the nature of these charges and how, what their, what their strategy is. Well, at the present, they're still trying to get them bail because they had bail for a day or two and then it was appealed by the government and they're back in, in prison now. So essentially, I was listening in on, in on the, a hearing the other day. Their lawyers seem to be conceding that, you know, they did this thing. But, you know, these people, if you look at their whole life, you're judging their whole life by like one hour of their life. And you're making it seem like they're more dangerous than they're the number one top percentile of most dangerous people in the country. And this is why they cannot be let out on bail. Whereas the actual allegation, the real the framing and the political framing and the judicial framing of this case is so out of proportion to the actual allegation which is what the lawyers seem to be highlighting that look they burned a dashboard you know the car was smashed that dashboard did not have a wife and kids at home the dashboard will you know it'll recover they get another dashboard but it's being described as this heinous crime with a necessitating extreme consequences but also extreme control measures and, you know, when you're in that position, when you're in prison and they're loading more and more charges onto you, bootstrapping more and more charges, and also you're, you know, not even getting bail, it sends a message to you in there too. The Overton window has moved that, you know, if I'm looking at 45 years, I'm already freaked out by being an MDC in solitary for all these days. You know, maybe seven years is like not so bad, or maybe 10 years is not so bad. When in reality, it's really bad for yeah. the actual crime. It's, it's, it's just a the Overton window's moving and they're trying to move it as far as they can in this case. What would you say the role of the public relations war in this is like, you know, this was the first piece. I mean, I, I remember when this first happens, you know, I caught it in the headlines. Um, I, you know, I definitely, you know, I had a concern that, you know, right out of the gate, if this case is getting covered like this, they're going to get really ridiculous draconian charges against them. And then, you know, it sort of <clears throat> went off my radar until I read your piece. And I think that the sort of public relations job um, so far on them has been really brutal and really effective. And so I'm wondering from, you know, in the kind of like broader strategy around fighting against these charges not again because first and foremost again first you know it's cruel and totally unfair to these two to i mean and no sane person could possibly agree that they should spend you know time in prison for burning a, a dashboard that they knew you know there's no Again, just to really reiterate, there's not no one in any the Justice Department prosecutors, no one has put forward the idea that they thought police were in the car, that they thought they were harming any sentient uh, being. This was purely, you know, a symbolic property act. Um, And then, yeah, that secondly, as you're saying, this is a this is a you. I mean, if you've been in any type of real protest environment like these protests have been, you know that the logic of these things, like you know, that 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 the that the charges can you know can that this will have a chilling effect, as you say. So, is there a sense around them that part of this fight back needs to happen with basically like public PR and communication? Uh, you know, in my opinion, this is all they have is the public perception in this case. And I think that's why the government went to such a great extent right away to start waging that PR battle uh, through the tabloids. Because they're trying to generate the sense of unsympathetic defendants in any case. And, you know, tapping into exactly the Tom Wolf stereotype that you mentioned. And, you know, if they can 
drain public sympathy or and even drain public attention from this case, they can give them any sentence they want and they can announce it at the end as this is the line has been a line in the sand for anyone who tries to engage in serious unrest in the future. And they always try to pick either unsympathetic defendants or make the defense look unsympathetic as possible down to, you know, very dirty tricks like editing videos to make them seem more incendiary and things like that. I think that the only way that this ends somewhat well for these people in this case, but also the precedent going forward is if it becomes a public issue, because as you said, no sane person can look at this and think this is proportional or normal and, you know, take away like, you know, what I'm not even defending what they did. It's like, you know, they just did something small, but you don't have to say it's great or the way that they framed their own actions. Maybe they, uh, it was a little provocative or whatever, but that's such a minuscule thing in relation to the actual issue here. That's why I was very mad at the New York times and CNN story. Cause these are not, not tabloids. They took a lot of time to report this. They accepted the government framing. They're like, well, you know, it was like, how could they do this? And like, how could they do what? They didn't really do anything. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. So, I mean, I mean you, look, you could say, I mean, it's so funny. And if we were in a sane world, you could say it was stupid. You could even like make fun of them a little bit. Like, oh, really? Like the car was already burned and now you're going to get your little like moment. I mean, look, there's plenty of ways to, cr- but all of that goes out the window and they're trying to completely destroy these two people's lives. It's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. Uh, and they're trying to make it seem like these guys did a mass shooting or something like that. Right. That's the framing of it. Whereas in reality, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, I'm totally, I'll be making fun of them right now if they weren't looking at 45 to life. <laughs> now I'm actually, now I'm actually very chilled. And right. if this passes, and even if they plead to a very serious, you know, relatively serious, like several years in jail to this, that's awful. And like, if they get, let's yes. say they get five years. Awful. That's, that's awful. That'll send a chilling awful. effect, an absolutely chilling effect. Their lives are destroyed in a million different ways. Who's going to feel comfortable protesting in any way outside of very defined control bounds in the future like no one should if that happens right and this is where right and we again there's like a slew of laws that people should look in that started mostly at the state level to criminalize nonviolent protest and civil disobedience radically and i and i just think like people need to know like you can have whatever i think you know hurting people uh, you know, innocent people obviously needs to be rejected. You can feel whatever way you feel about property damage. And then if you have any kind of seriousness about politics, you recognize that in order for a protest to do anything, it can't just be like, okay, like this is where you have a permit and you can like sit in your little box and wave your signs for an hour. Like it, it has to, with the ver- I mean, you know, the capacity for direct action, for civil disobedience, for walking on a street, you know, these things that are all technically whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're getting seriously criminalized, including like, you know, there was an effort in some states to try to give immunity for people that, as an example, drive their cars through protesters, which we've been seeing. So this is the, you know, this is the parallel of that and what they're trying to do here. They didn't say like, hey, that's a little silly go do 20 hours of community service or whatever. Right. No, it's like this case is so serious. And if, you know, the elevation of this at all levels of the government, the politicization, the extent they're going, the effort they're putting into prosecuting this, you know, very small property damage incident, uh, it's very telling. And I think that if they do lay down this marker, the only protest a lot of people are going to feel comfortable doing given the present alignment of power is exactly what you said, go stand in the box with the sign and, you know, your permit ends at 4.30 and then you go home, which does not necessarily not have utility, but it's not a threat or it does not alarm people in power the way that an uncontrolled civil disturbance does, which entails sometimes property damage or right. other forms of uh, disruption. So, you know, I mean, if this ca- happens it's going to be a disaster and people need to pay attention in this case because the government is trying to signal the Trump administration signaling to their base that, you know, we are going to show you, you think we're not strong. We can't crack down on dissent. Watch this. And, you know, it's going to be culturally satisfying to you on multiple levels too. And we're going to show you that we're going to deal with these people and who they are and so forth. So there needs to be a corresponding effort to look at it from the other side Otherwise, you're gonna, they're going to be granted a very great political victory, which they're trying to achieve. 
and the consequences legally will be long lasting. Well, then let's in the last couple of minutes, I mean, really make that 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 case, right? That that okay. So this specific action is it's not you know it's it's nothing that deserves even a day in jail. All right, you could say it's stupid. You can make fun of it. You could say you need a little you know whatever. Do a couple hours of community service, or you could say nothing, uh, but no jail time um, for for scorching. Uh, the dashboard of an already destroyed car with no people anywhere nearby. This is no jail time. So setting that aside, let's also look at the whole context of two people who actually have, you know, worked their way up. They've actually risen in the sort of, uh, you know, uh, career and class system at a time when that's an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, one of them obviously is committed sort of generally through practicing public interest law and they have decided, um, that, you know, in, in spite of that, that they're not going to just sort of like, you know, sit at home in a comfortable circumstance. Because one of the things people have pointed out, which is true, that part of the reason that some of the, some of the protests and willingness to take risks have been so intense is because there is a mass unemployment crisis in this country and that makes people's calculus different. And that is totally true. These people were courageous enough with secure jobs, secure overall pretty desirable jobs to still say that they are going to go out and make a mark against uh, police murder, police brutality uh, and racism in this country. That's extraordinarily admirable. This is the thing too. They've been trying to portray them in this uh radical chic way but these people actually it's not that they were handed everything they came from great right. adversity to get this Colin for Mattis grew up in East New York which is an extremely rough neighborhood of Brooklyn and he you know his lost his parents he was in the process of adopting these foster kids he came from great adversity to became who he was and Aruj Rahman working class immigrant in Brooklyn doing public interest law in the Bronx what, there's something happening in the country that makes people feel that the normal channels to address obvious injustices are no longer, you know, working. So when that happens, people will act outside of the system and they didn't go and kill somebody or attack a police officer or try doing anything like that. They engaged in a symbolic act of property damage to express protest is what they feel as, you know, as we all observe as great injustice is happening on a daily basis, which they cannot address. This is actually a very admirable thing. It's not absolutely. It's actually not even what they're making it seem like. But the character assassination that's been going on has been so thorough that they're trying to, you know, make you, people either accept it or even side with them and celebrate this as you know getting these people who you know ingrates who did this thing that you know was so stupid. It's actually it's uh, the framing is all wrong, and you know it. I think it behooves us to pay as much attention as possible to this case because. Without that attention, these people will be in very, very dire straits. Yeah. So how do you think, I mean, other than, you know, people using social media platforms or whatever, I mean, do you think it's even like worth, you know, looping back with the reporters for New York Times and CNN as an example and saying like, hey, you know, your initial reporting on this was garbage. You should relook at this. Maybe talk to the, you know, well, you know, his parents have passed, but she still has family. I mean, it's a very serious human dimension to this. And it was completely and viciously misrepresented. Again, with irony of all ironies, especially in like these kind of like resistance outlets, it's like, because you're uncritically accepting the That's propaganda crazy. of an administration crazy. that every second you're talking about how dishonest they are. And well, yeah, they are, right. Uh, you know, it's this thing that bothers me so much. And Wesley Lowry actually wrote about it in op-ed recently in the Times. Uh, it's that there's this mode of reporting, which is rewriting the press releases. This right. is a very common form of reporting. Let's take the government press release. Let's, you know, change the sentences around a little bit, add a few new words. And let's add a little, like, few things to it, too, maybe, just to flesh it out a bit. But the core of it is the government press release. There's not attempt to reconceptualize what happened or look at it from any other perspective. Even in this case... When it's so glaring, you know, I'll tell you something in the context of this case, uh, several dozen former prosecutors issued a statement criticizing the government for refusing to grant them bail. It's the, the extreme step of doing this Former prosecutors. The CNN story 
describe this as an un- unusual step. Like, why would they do that? That's, you know, very strange, given these people were radicalized and all this stuff. So, I mean, they're acting as handmaidens, helping shuffle the process along of these people into jail and further cementing the authoritarianism of which they're so vocally uh, in rhetoric against. Right. But then it's like, right. And that's what gets, I mean, that's what people loathe about them. It's like, you know, how many think pieces, oh, you know, Trump called Acosta a jerk. Let's write 50 oh, pieces about that. Oh, they're trying to railroad two young people who, you know, whatever, did something silly in the overall context of of fighting a fight that's absolutely righteous. Let's go along with having their lives destroyed. I see. I'm pretty cynical. I was shocked by this reporting. Yeah. I was yeah. unbelievably shocked. The, the tabloids, like, you know, whatever, they're tabloids. But the fact that it was uncritically accepted at every level of the press, pretty much, is shocking. It's just people, you know, speaking out independently who are saying something different about on social media or people politically, some small independent outlets like The Intercept. But generally speaking, and this conversation we're having now, without this, there will be only one narrative, which narrative, which is objectively insane. Objectively insane. Well, Murtaza Hussein, thank you so much. It's a great piece. Everybody, please read it. And then really, I mean, this is one where actually social media amplification is important um, because they got absolutely the spin job, the hit job was on them quick. And then these charges are absolutely malevolent and dangerous for anybody that cares about civil liberties of any kind. So Mataza, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. And will you continue to be covering this and writing on it? I will. I will. We'll okay. keep covering it. Great. Well, everybody find all of Mataza's great work at The Intercept. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Take care. Be well. All right, folks.